Good morning, family. Thank you for joining me today. If you're a germaphobe, like some people I know, then this sermon just might be for you. Last week, I may have left you with the impression that we were finished talking about food and bread. But this morning, the act of eating leads us to a discussion about Jesus' understanding about what it means to be pure, be holy and pleasing in God's sight. We won't talk about Jesus being bread, and we won't use any of that disturbing language about eating flesh and drinking blood that we heard last week. But we will talk about eating, per se, or what to eat. But we'll consider how some people eat. Our text today is Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Then we'll skip to verses 14 and 15, and we'll finish with verses 21 through 23. Now, don't worry about the verses we'll miss, because I'm going to try to fill in those blanks for you in a bit. Okay? Hear the word of the Lord. The Pharisees and some legal experts from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They saw some of his disciples eating food with unclean hands. They were eating without first ritually purifying their hands through washing. The Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat without first washing their hands carefully. This is a way of observing the rules handed down by the elders. Upon returning from the marketplace, they don't eat without first immersing themselves. They observe many other rules that have been handed down, such as the washing of cups, jugs, pans, and sleeping mats. So the Pharisees and legal experts ask Jesus, why are your disciples not living according to the rules handed down by the elders, but instead eat food with ritually unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah really knew what he was talking about when he prophesied about you hypocrites. He wrote, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. Their worship of me is empty, since they teach instructions that are human words. You ignore God's commandment while holding on to rules created by humans and handed down to you. Then Jesus called the crowd again and said, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. Nothing outside of a person can enter and contaminate a person in God's sight. Rather, the things that come out of a person contaminate the person. It's from the inside, from the human heart, that evil thoughts come sexual sins, thefts, murders, adultery, greed, evil actions, deceit, unrestrained immorality, envy, insults, arrogance, and foolishness. All these evil things come from the inside and contaminate a person in God's sight. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If your mom was anything like mine, she insisted that you wash your hands before you sat down at the dinner table. My mom insisted on inspecting my hands before I sat down to eat. Did you use soap? Was a common question in our house. Go wash them again, and this time use soap. Personally, as a nine-year-old, I didn't think there was anything wrong with not washing your hands. I also didn't think there was anything wrong with not using soap but my mom had a way of being very persuasive. Today, one of our mealtime traditions in my house is the passing of the hand sanitizer. In church, we pass the peace. In our house, we pass the Purell. Now, years ago, when I lived in New York City, it was not uncommon to see a sink in the dining area of a restaurant. I asked a friend one day why there was a sink in the restaurant in which we were eating, and he said, oh, that's for the Orthodox Jews to say, Natilat Yadayim. That's the ritual washing of hands before eating a meal with bread in it. As we ate dinner, I watched Jewish diners go to the sink, let the water run over their hands, and then raise their hands to chest height as they recited a prayer of blessing, Natilat Yadayim, before they ate their meal. And who hasn't gone into a restroom in a restaurant and seen signs that say, Employees must wash their hands before returning to work. Now, especially in this pandemic age, washing your hands doesn't seem unusual or excessive, does it? I guess my mom was right. 
wash your hands, kill the germs. Well, our gospel reading today really doesn't have anything to do with personal hygiene. It's about religious hygiene. It's about symbolic religious practices. The Law of Moses addressed ritual purity. It covered all sorts of things from normal bodily fluids to sex, from touching a dead body to mixing milk and meat. It addressed anything that could make one ritually unclean and therefore barred from worshiping in the temple. Now, let me say that uncleanness was not the same as sinfulness. In biblical times, a person could become ritually unclean in the normal course of life. The remedy for uncleanness was not repentance, but ritual cleansing. Today's exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees was not really about ritual purity. It was about how the Pharisees used laws to construct a system of ritual piety or religiosity. Now we need to keep in mind that Mark wrote his gospel account in large part, for people from Rome. They were Gentiles, not Jews, who lived in a different part of the world. They were people with little understanding, little appreciation for the law of Moses or for Jewish cleansing rites and rituals. That's why Mark inserted a bit of commentary to explain things to his Roman audience. While Mark's explanation is accurate, it is a bit exaggerated. All the Jews, as Mark claimed, almost certainly did not wash before eating. But the religious leaders and teachers of the law, we call them Pharisees, they certainly did. Mark correctly tells us that hand washing was the tradition of the elders. That means that it was not actually required under the law of Moses. The law of Moses said nothing about ordinary people washing their hands before eating bread. However, the law did say that the priests must wash before performing sacrifices at the altar in the temple. You see, the laws of ritual purity, as practical as they were, were intended to teach the people about the holiness of God. But for the religious leaders and teachers of the law, that was not enough. There was a whole long tradition among Jewish rabbis that amplified the commandment to include everyone. I mean, if it's good for priests, then why wouldn't it be good for ordinary people, right? Isn't every piece of bread a holy offering to God? Isn't it a good thing to bring priestly practice into everyday life? Now, when these people see Jesus' disciples eating with unwashed hands, they have a cow. Why don't your disciples wash their hands before eating their bread, they demand. Jesus responds by quoting the greatest of the prophets, the prophet Isaiah, and his response goes directly to the heart of the matter. While people's words and even their actions may appear to honor God, their hearts can still be saturated with pride and sin. In a word, it's hypocrisy. And Isaiah added, the laws that these people promote in order to demonstrate their holiness don't even come from God. They're man-made. They're man-imposed. Then Jesus delivers the knockout blow. You ignore God's commandment while holding on to rules created by humans and handed down to you. Our passage today skipped about six verses, so I'll tell you what we missed. Jesus went on a bit of a rant about the danger of looking holy. He warned about appearing to be pious and righteous all the while being self-serving and having little or no interest in honoring God. You can attend church every week. You can speak and church speak. You can condemn sinfulness and hurtful behavior. You can make a show of your faith. And you can still, in your heart of hearts, be vile and selfish and disgusting. That's when Jesus turned to speak to the people who had gathered around to observe his takedown of the religious professionals. He said, nothing outside of a person can enter and contaminate a person in God's sight. Rather, the things that come out of a person contaminate the person. Even though Jesus says that nothing outside can defile, he is talking about food. 
There are lots of things from outside us that can defile us. Things like indulging in forms of entertainment that are explicitly and gratuitously sexual or violent, or adopting political or social ideologies that come from outside, but they stick, don't they? And they corrupt our hearts and our lives. Again, we skipped a few verses where Jesus says, don't you understand either? Don't you know that nothing from the outside that enters a person has the power to contaminate? That's because it doesn't enter into the heart, but into the stomach, and it goes out into the sewer. By saying this, Jesus declared that no food could contaminate a person in God's sight. Again, as we saw last week, Jesus' words confounded his disciples. And we are just as likely to misunderstand his words if we're not careful. It's no wonder that this was a new concept for them. They had been trained to observe the minutia of the law, but they had not been taught its true purpose. In the biblical worldview, the heart is the control center of the mind and will and the body. Not, of course, the literal organ that pumps blood throughout our bodies, but the figurative core of our being, of who we are. It's the heart that breeds human perversity, not outward things like food and drink. Jesus is making a strong distinction here between the religion of the heart and the purely outward religion of the legal code. It's not that Jesus rejected the law, but that he pointed out its limits. Laws cannot change the orientation of a person's heart. I grew up in a church culture that was very dedicated to keeping rules. We had a long list of do's and don'ts, and there was certainly no shortage of rules. Rules like keep the Sabbath day holy. It was one of the chief indicators of your dedication to Jesus. So on Sundays, we didn't watch TV. We didn't read the newspaper. We didn't play. We went to church. We did our homework. But one day, my grandparents, holy, God-fearing, saintly people, came to stay with us. And guess what happened? One Sunday afternoon, my grandfather turned on the TV. Not only did he watch TV, he watched sports on a Sunday. And he broke out the Sunday newspaper and handed me the comics. How could my saintly grandparents violate the sanctity of Sunday? and still believe in God. That was my earliest introduction into the problem with laws. That's when I began to learn that piety and purity were not the same thing. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that one day a man came to Jesus. The man was struggling with piety and purity. He was pious, but he wasn't pure. What must I do to inherit the abundant life of God's kingdom, he asked Jesus. I've kept all the rules. I obey all the laws. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, all you have to do is love God with all your heart and soul, with all of your mind and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. God calls us to love, not to be legalistic, God calls us to be pure, not to keep a bunch of rules and regulations. Do you have to wash your hands? No, but should you? Absolutely. Yes, you should. God calls us to love him with all of our hearts and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So we are to avoid the things that prevent us from doing that. And we should do the things that help us to love and care more and more. Do the things that draw you closer to Jesus. Do the things that resemble Jesus. Do the types of things that Jesus would do if he were in your shoes. And avoid the things that interrupt your relationship with him. That, I think, is true religion. And I believe that's what God asks of you and me. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Good and gentle God, we want to serve you and to be pure in your sight. We want to show your love 
where love demands to be shown. We want to be your touch where lives might be made whole. We want to speak your word to those who would deny your power. We want to be your light and draw others to your throne. Help us to not settle for appearances, but to truly make choices and live lives that honor and glorify you. Help us to do these things, to do the things that Jesus would do. Help us to grow in you. Today, Father, we remember and pray for those who are in need, especially for those who are ill. Again, we pray for those who are afflicted and affected by COVID-19. Give us wisdom, direction, and protection, we pray. We pray for those battling wildfires. We pray for the people of Haiti and for those recovering from earthquakes and for those who are dreading and dealing with hurricanes. We pray for the people of Afghanistan and for those seeking refuge, asylum, and safety. Help us, your disciples, to bring your love and your healing to those who desperately need it. Help us to comfort and care for those who are the last, the least, the lost, and the left out. And now using the words debts and debtors, let us pray with boldness the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today. Was this message helpful to you? If so, will you share this video with three friends this week? Remember, your job this week is to love at least three people and make sure at least one of them doesn't deserve it. Because everyone needs love. And everyone needs to know that God loves them no matter what, right? Please don't let all the craziness of life rob you of your joy. With Jesus, we always, always, always have hope. Now receive these words of benediction today. May the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face to you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen.